Timothy was both half Jew and half Greek, so half European, half, uh, half Hebrew, which would put him in the Asian area. And he had such a mixture. And as I studied more and more about those that were close to him, I found out that he had uh, Zenos, a lawyer, Luke, a physician, you know, at that level was uh, was solid professionals in society, but he also had Onesimus, a slave, and helped to get Onesimus freed. And so as you watch the, the, the uh, young, what would you think? You'd think, what's holding them together? And the only thing they could finally conclude is, it's what their message is saying, it's Jesus. That's what's holding them together. And that's what must hold us together. But in the process, as we start seeing our boundaries, it also uh, lets us know this is, a, this is the edge of the ship. You can, you can go all over the ship. You can even be in rebellion against the captain of the ship. But when you come to that final rail, <laughs> you're the, you should either submit or you're overboard. And there are certain rails that we have, the final rails, that are protections for us. And uh, Dr. Schaefer would call them presuppositional uh, truths, but I'll just use a, one that'll fit me better and just say, well, they're foundational truths. There's something that you don't, it doesn't move. And the four basics that he gave us was who is God, who is man, what is truth, and what are responsibilities. And so I'm going to just give a very... Uh, cryptic uh, description here of something that is so vast like God that you can talk forever <laughs> and never get to the end. This, we, we got that hint uh, of, uh, even more than a hint with David as he's talking about eternity and, and just learning from God and how exciting it will be and with no lid on it. You know, you have eternity and you don't have sin and Satan and suddenly you're free to soar and uh, people say, well, how could you go on for all eternity just, you know, uh, just you and God? Well, you don't understand who God is because God is infinite. God is personal. Now, as we think about infinite and personal, you say, well, that's right. We can, we've always heard that. No other religion has it. No other religion has an infinite God who is personal. You will find other religions, and you take the basic ones that are known worldwide. They have... Uh, either an infinite God, but he's impersonal, or they have a finite God, and he's impersonal, and you also have an impersonal finite God, or a personal finite God. You have other combinations, but in terms of infinite and personal, only the God of the Bible is both infinite and personal. I'll test it a little bit. I was speaking in, in Cambridge University at Trinity College where the experts of, of all of the religions were. And so I, I challenged them with this statement. And uh, none of them, they were experts in, in all the uh, classic religions, but they could not really dispute this. So as you, you think about it, the Hindus have Brahma and Shiva, who are infinite, but they're not personal. They have Kali, who is personal, but not infinite. And in Calcutta, after whom Kali, you know, it's named after Kali, Kali is the, the goddess who stands on the beheaded body of her husband with his, her head, with his head in her hand that she's taken off of his body. And uh, so there seemed to be a problem there in the home. I don't know what it was exactly. But yes, it was headship. <laughs> oh, that was bad. <laughs> oh, you can groan with me on that one. But uh, I don't know where that one came from. But anyway, put it back. yeah, put it, put it back. The, uh, the, the Greeks had personal gods, but Zeus, you know, the king god, he was born on the island of Crete. He was finite. And if you're born or created like angels, you have a beginning. 
You're going to be able to sell your, celebrate your 5,367,204th birthday in heaven. You see, you, you will always be able to count because of who you are. The Koreans will be able to start just three months before you started. But <laughs> they have, I, when I'm in Korea, you know, and I say, well, I guess Korean age, I'm 75 now last month. But uh, I say, not really. When it counts to age, I'm American because <laughs> I'm only 74. But uh, they, they add the year uh, of, yeah, one year prior. And uh, so as, as you think about it, though, it's always a beginning. There's always a beginning. Satan is not infinite. He has a beginning. I heard a, or read, I guess, a theologian saying that Satan, the only area of, of, of infiniteness he had was, was uh, I think it was knowledge. And I thought, what in the world are you saying? Of course he doesn't have infinite knowledge. Only God does. Only God does. And all the rest of us, it, we had a beginning, therefore we have a beginning of our knowledge. And from that point on, we can learn, but, but we are not ever going to be infinite. We're never going to exhaust who God is in his infiniteness. And uh, my little nine-year-old, she's getting, uh, you know, precocious on some of these things. And, and I said, well, give me a number, Maddie. She says, infinite plus, plus six. <laughs> okay, okay. So, uh, but there, there is either infinite or it's not. And that's the way life is. And yet for God, it's something you just can't get grasp. Now, how can we describe infinite? Well, you, you just really can't, except when my three-year-old son, and we were over in England, and this is the miracle is that you could see the stars that night, and, <laughs> excuse me, British, but anyway, uh, he had asked me in the room, he said, uh, we were at the Y1 base there, he said, Daddy, uh, how big, oh no, he started with, who is God's mommy? Mommy. Oh man. Oh man. How do you ask, answer a three year old who God's mommy is? <laughs> okay. And so he's taking it from where he lives into who God is. And so I said, come with me, son. We'll go outside. And I, I pointed at the stars. I said, I want you to count them for me. You've learned to count now. Go ahead and count them. So he starts and finally looks at me and he says, I can't, Daddy. There's too many. I said, God can. And he made them. Oh, now, what we were talking would be what Francis Schaeffer would call propositional truth. That is, you can't prove the infinite, whatever it is. Take an angle, you know, a 45-degree angle or a 90 degree angle, and you say it goes into the infinite. Well, you can measure it in the finite, but you can never measure it in the infinite, but God can. But we, we assume propositional truth. We, we accept the fact, logically, it goes into the infinite. There's no one that says, I can prove that, who is of right mind, but they, they, there's not too many that I would hear of right mind that would say, it, it squiggles after the, you know, it goes another direction after, after it hits infinite. No, come on. That's just, you know, you're just uh, <laughs> batting your teeth together. There's no, no uh, truth or reality in that, in our understanding and so on. But when you understand that the Bible reveals God is infinite from a finite mind who was writing it, but from the infinite mind who was dictating it. You have to say it was God-inspired. It was God-authorized. It was God-ignited. So it had to have begun from God even to get a concept that is so above man. The other is, as you think about the infinite God, I, well, I, I'll take it a little further with my son, uh, I was able to go inside and, 
and say to him that night, now I want you to count my hair. And at that time it was harder to do. And, uh, and he, again, he was exasperated. He just said, I can't. I even underlined it at a later time out at the beach. I said, now count these sands, the little grains of sand, would you? And again, showing him the infiniteness of God is in what he sees, not because it is infinite, but because it's so much beyond us that it had to take someone who was infinite to create it. And, uh, but uh, as I talked to them, him about God, and I said, now God is so great, so great, that he, he can count my hair. He knows how many stars there are. He knows the number. He even knows the names of them. And he also made them. Oh, I have a nephew, and he was about that age. And they took him to uh, one of these. Uh, in Arkansas, they have an a outdoor a passion play. And they have a big statue of Jesus. Is that where it is? Out, yeah, where? Yeah. And so my sister was taking him there when he was just a little child, and he came up and he said, I knew God was big, but not that big. <laughs> you know, <laughs> the big uh, yeah, art, art piece of who Jesus was. But as, as we understand how big he is, he's bigger. And he's always bigger. He's always greater. And so as we think about the greatness of God, it inspires us to become greater than where we are. And that's our growth in understanding the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And so it's important that we understand God is infinite. But you will also understand that God is personal. You know, I, I, I think of uh, some several years ago that we're in the pulpits, you know, in, in certain uh, mainline churches for years and suddenly... And, and when they prayed, you could, you could really hear their, their theological seminary conceptual teaching coming forth. Oh, God, omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent. And everybody's nodding to sleep. And so, and then suddenly the same guy in the same pulpit comes in and he starts to pray. Oh, Lord, I love you. You've been so good to me this week. What's happened? God's changed. No, he met him. <laughs> you see, when you meet God, he becomes, uh, for you, your heavenly Abba, which is personal, Daddy. And you begin to understand that this, he's, he's not, because he's infinite, he can be so personal to you, and yet, so personal to everyone else at the same time. That part we can't quite understand. We can't cope with that. But we can understand he's personal to us. A personal God. I went to Egypt the first time in 1960 and spoke there. And, and I learned this, uh, that in, uh, I was just a single young man. And, uh, and preaching in the church, they had... In an evangelical church, they had a wall from the pulpit right to the back wall. On this side were the women, on that side were the men. Now, they had been under the Muslim influence for a long time. And the women could say nothing, cough, coughing was out, and certainly praying out loud was out for them, and uh, so on. But they could sing outside, out loud. That was the one thing that was okay still. But uh, the men could do all the other. And I, I've watched that wall fall. And uh, my book on Why Not Women, with, uh, together with David Hamilton, uh, is in Arabic. And, and it's helping things along a little bit, too, there. To get out of that Muslim mindset, which has really goes back to the Greek mindset, which has permeated a lot of our thinking. And so as, as we, uh, uh, I was speaking there, I learned that little children out in the countryside, when they came in, they would say, as they ran to their, their father, they would say, Abba, Abba. Now, in Korean, you say, Appa. And uh, we have other languages here. In German, Papa. And uh, French, Papa. Baba. 
in Chinese. And so we have our endearing term we use for our Father. And when Jesus said, Our Father who art in heaven, he, he wasn't using the formal term. He was, he was talking to his daddy. And Jesus uses that term, Abba, which means daddy. And it's Aramaic and also into the Arabic, especially in the countryside. And so as, uh, as he was uh, in Romans, it tells us, and it uses the term, in fact, Abba is left in the English three times because they don't, they don't know quite whether to put, you know, well, this is talking about God. Can we really use Abba, even though Jesus said it and Paul said it? But they can't quite leave out the Father because, you know, he's supposed to be way up there. And so I, I think that in no way are you being either blasphemous or pulling God down from his infinite ways to be relationally tied to him through Jesus Christ. Because Christ becomes the one that brings us to Abba, Father. And I had to say both, didn't I, to quote. But he brings us to Abba. And as he brings us to Daddy, there is that personal, personal, personal relationship. And it's so close and so real that when you meet him, even if you've had all the training of seminary and much more than that, and then suddenly you know him personally. You don't just talk about his natural attributes in your prayer time, though you can refer to them, of course. But when you're addressing him, you can walk right into the th uh, throne room of God and boldly, <laughs> boldly talk to your daddy. I, a, a true story in history in the White House, back in the Lincoln days, there was... Uh, a man trying to get in to see the president. Well, you know, today it would really, really be a challenge. But uh, he was unannounced, but he had something very important that he felt he had to share with the president. And he tried. He was rebuffed at every, every stage. And finally, he's just standing downcast outside on the front lawn. No big gates at that time. And as he just was standing there, a little boy came up and he said, What's the matter? Mister, you don't look happy. Oh, no, son, it's all right. No, you don't look happy. Wh what's wrong? Maybe I can help you. He says, no, I don't think so. Pressed him again. He says, well, I have to see the president, and I can't. He said, come on. And he grabbed him by the hand and led him past all the guards and the secretaries and led him right into the Oval Office and said, Daddy, this man needs to see you. Now, that's the story of Jesus. He just walks us right into the throne room and said, Daddy, this is one of your sons or daughters, and you become joint heirs with Jesus. It's so gracious to understand the personal God. Now, time will not allow to extrapolate too much here, but I want to go into personal because often it's, it's, it's left up there conceptually so much that we don't get to bring it in application. But the personality of God is important because we are made in his image. Now, we are not made in his infinite natural uh, attribute of infiniteness, but we are made in the personal image of God. We have a personality. Now, we're not projecting our personality on, onto our, our God, but by revelation, it is shown in the Word of God. As Dr. Schaefer would say and said, he said, all of these presuppositional truths are presented in a variety of ways in the first six chapters of the Bible and never contradicted in the whole of the Bible. And so he said, this is why the atheist will always attack the first six chapters of the Bible because it's the revelation of who God is. But God never tries to defend these presuppositions. He states them as fact. That's the truth. And you can argue over whether it exists or not, but you can never prove their, their lack of existence. And, of course, atheism, I, I learned in philosophy that you can never prove a, a, a philosophical negative. 
but you can prove a philosophical positive if there if there's evidences and and so on uh, that you you can uh, you can uh, present and begin to describe. So you can prove there's a God, and I've spoken on this in many universities and colleges around the world. But you have to go into the difference between personal truth, experiential truth, and, and uh, philosophical or conceptual truth. And when you bring it into the personal and you say, God spoke to me, God spoke to me, and he said this, and then this happened, I'm a witness, I'm a witness. And that's what we're called to be. Ye shall be witnesses unto me. As we describe who God is to us. I remember riding a train down in New Zealand. I was going down to Wellington. And uh, in, in the car was a young man in college. And so I started talking to him. And I, I started to move toward the philosophical approach. And, uh, you know, and he was very much resistive and all the rest. And I just stopped. And I thought, this is stupid. I, I just turned. I said, you know what happened to me? And I told him a story. And when I did, I, I, it was a miraculous thing of, about our accident and so on that Darlene and I had. And uh, he said, you should have started with that. You've got me now. <laughs> sure. You see, you're a witness first. You're not an arguer. And uh, I learned that from one of our, our leaders. I just saw Gary. And uh, Gary was our leader in Spain. And uh, he still lives there and works there for, I don't know, 40 years almost. And uh, Gary had taken a, a time off. And I'd, I had really developed uh, the arguments of uh, how to, how to out-argue the the, the, the cults and so on, other religions as well. So a pastor and I, were we were uh, going from house to house up in the Seattle area, and we came across the, turned out he was the head of that region for the Jehovah Witness. And so we asked if we could come in and talk to him about the Lord, and he said, please, you know, the, the, the spider to the fly. And uh, we went in and and so as soon as I found out who he was, I went to the Green Book. That's their Bible. It's always green, and it, it's always changed. And the, they changed the original in, to line up with their, their, their teachings. And so I, I began to talk about Jesus as Jehovah, which is totally, <laughs> it's, it's an anathema to them to say that. And so and I, I proved it by his Bible in Old Testament, New Testament quotes and so on and Jesus is Jehovah and so finally after two hours he got so mad he threw us out almost bodily and we went down the road laughing we had won we had really won the argument and then then I after that I just met Gary and Gary had uh, just been home on a short leave at his father's house and two uh, Jehovah Witness came up to his door and uh, he was just telling me the story of what had just happened to him. And he said, I said, Lord, what do you want me to say to them? And the Lord said, just tell them about our time together this morning. And he began to describe how that morning Jesus was so real to him. And he, when they came to the door, he immediately said, Oh, come in. I've been wanting to tell somebody what happened to me. And they didn't get to start even on the spiel. And, and they sat down, and he, he started telling this, and he'd had such a precious time. And finally, one of them says, how do you know him like that? You see the cry of the heart? And then I began to think, how many Jehovah Witnesses, I, I, I talked to a lot of them, how many did I ever win? I won one over here in Haleiwa in Oahu, but she didn't know anything about what she believed. She was just a whole witness. And I, I didn't even get a chance to do that. I didn't have, have a chance to argue. And I, I found is, you know, the Lord says, I'm going to put you out as sheep among wolves. 
But you don't become a wolf to win over a wolf. You have to move in the opposite spirit. And I was moving in the same spirit of contention and argumentation and so on, and then wondering why I couldn't win Jehovah's Witness to the Lord. And so we have to understand, as we move with God, he will show us the right ways to move in. So as we think about, though, the personality of God, I think it's important for us to have our context and understand how, uh, what kind of sideboards there are to our wagon. And as we understand that, we can begin to move further and understand more about the Word of God, and, and uh, we will see that everything I'm talking to you about is in the Word of God. First of all, anyone who is personal has to have an intellect. Does God have an intellect? Anybody disagree? All right. How, how pervasive is that in intellect? We, we say uh, he's consciously aware. How much is he consciously aware? Infinitely. See, you, you can't limit his infiniteness. He is infinitely aware of all that is knowable in all of eternity past and future, and I don't understand what I'm saying because I have a finite mind. So let's not argue over the infinite <laughs> unless we become that, okay? <laughs> become more godly. But as, as you think about his conscious awareness, Psalms 139 says that even if you make your bed in hell, God is aware of you. He knows. He's consciously aware of where we are, who we are, and, and, uh, and everything about us. In 1 Kings 8.39, it says there that only God knows your heart. Only God knows the secrets of your heart. Now, you know, we give Satan far too much on this kind of thing. Oh, Satan knew what I was thinking and that. Where do you get that in the Bible? He can see the manifestations, but only God knows your heart. Not even you know your heart fully. You can know a little bit about it, but he knows it completely. And if, since only God knows your heart, Satan doesn't. So how, how are we to, to battle against the enemy? Don't give him clues on the outside of what what you are on the inside by having Jesus begin to rule and reign inside over those areas that causes, uh, that allows Satan or one of his delegates. And maybe I should say here, uh, we don't have to spend all of our time uh, battling with Satan, but you must understand where Satan is battling against you or the body at any given time. This is not new. It's Martin Luther's statement. If you're not in warfare with Satan over what he's attacking at any time and you're considering some other area uh, that happened maybe last generation, you're not really battling Satan at all because it's, he's only in one place at one time. He only has finite knowledge though he is a lot brighter than we are individually. But Jesus in us is greater than he that's in the world. So he's only one place at one time. He doesn't have all power, and he doesn't have all knowledge. Don't give it to him in your thinking. So we can also say that Satan has one-third of the angels. But they are finite too, and the number is finite. And angels don't marry and reproduce. He's got... An, a, a worker's problem. He, in heaven, he, he couldn't even win an election, see. But if every angel fell, they didn't, two-thirds didn't, then he still couldn't win because Jesus is God. So when it starts in Genesis, in the beginning, God, the word is Elohim, that's plural. That's plural. And then he says, 
in verse 27, let us make man in our own image. Let us. So you have the Trinity from the very first word of the Bible, the first phrase of the Bible, in the beginning, God, the third word. And Elohim, plural. And yet we don't believe in gods in great numbers, but we do see Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and yet the three are one, and that's infinite unity. And we, we go out, outside our, our vocabulary and our intellect when we try to get into understanding fully the Trinity. So we can only do our best, but we understand the Trinity is one. And as we think of his intellect, the thing I'm describing about Father God or Son or Holy Spirit, they're still the same, okay? When we think about his intellect, God, does he have reason? I'll ask it in a question. If so, give me scripture. All right, Isaiah 118. Isaiah 118 says, come let us reason together. So God is reasonable. But here's the difference. What is reason? Well, you state your premise and, you know, logically you reach your conclusion. It's really the, it's the beginnings of the scientific method. And so that is reasonable. All right? Because we have finite premises and finite logic and finite conclusions, his thoughts are higher than ours. He has infinite of all of that. So when we understand that, and I'm trying to challenge and love God with our minds this afternoon. Don't just think, oh boy, that's not spiritual. When you love God with your mind, it is spiritual. Like loving God with your body. And uh, day start, is start day, what do you call it? Day start. Yeah, day starter, that's it. Uh, this morning... Uh, we broke pattern. We didn't start with singing so many songs and so on. Now, there's a reason behind that. We can get very religious. You have to start in this way and this hymnal and that number always first. Well, wait a minute. That can become a religious routine that becomes a tradition that becomes a bondage eventually. So, we love God with our body. So, we start with the exercise. I was doing my own up at the house this morning. He has me aerobics in the morning and <laughs> the other in the afternoon, <laughs> the strength. And so <laughs> I got an hour and you got 15 minutes. I, that's an hour just in the evening. But uh, yeah, and uh, a half hour at least in the morning. But as, as, uh, as we're loving him with our strength, then we start to do things that will limit those things that we shouldn't be doing. Like, I just had a cookie back there. And uh, <laughs> how many are going to judge me, huh? <laughs> no, you ate cookies too, didn't you? <laughs> many of you. But uh, the Koreans, they don't like all the sweets, right? You, oh, you, you've learned to like them. <laughs> Shame on you. But uh, they had one of the most healthy diets in the world until McDonald's came. But... Uh, the, the whole thing about reasonableness, that if you really live by faith, you, don't, you throw out, you cut off your head and you throw out reason. That is not right. You love God with your mind. And that doesn't mean that you should be dumber and therefore more faith and see God do more miracles. That's not true. That's just not true. But if our thinking is wrong, and our presuppositions are wrong, we're going to get the wrong conclusions. So that's why we have to see that God is infinite and personal. We're finite, and imp we're personal too, but we're made in the image of God. That's the second basic. So as we follow through with this, and we start with, with the reasonableness, come let us reason together with the Lord, and uh, or, or together with him, you are literally participating in something that is, is a wonderful experience with the Lord. And he can give you answers way above yourself. Now, scientifically, I, 
I'm advanced to the be able to turn on the light now. I don't know how it works, but I can switch, and there's light. But Dr. Momstead, he was so far out there, you know, and uh, and he, he would talk to to us and to me in private times about how God gave him the the new concept, and he'd find that it was just amazing. Another one is uh, dear uh, Brother Gil Hill, a, a friend of many, many, many years, and has been on one of our boards for years, but. Uh, he was telling me, you know, I was just to see him, and now he's in a, a care center. And uh, I, as uh, we've walked together 30-some years, but he's a real creative scientist. I mean, just always coming up with new ideas and so on. And he, he said to me, he said, Lauren, don't worry about the nation, Amer America, losing steel mills. Let them go. He says, the new thing is carbon, what is it? I don't know what he, <laughs> the second word is, but he said, it's going to be really lightweight, and airplanes will be made out of it, cars, and, okay, carbon composite, and uh, even houses will be made out of it and so on, because it's so strong, and da-da-da-da. And I just, I, I, he's always dazzled me. But, uh, as we're going to hear, is it tomorrow night, the scientist coming? Tomorrow night. You're going to hear a guy tell how God spoke to him and gave him ideas. And then people start to honor him for it. And uh, Howard was honored after he died as the number one chemist in all the history of America. The number one scientist in chemistry of all of America. And at a gathering of 30,000 scientists and entrepreneurs as they gathered together. And, uh, but God always got the glory through him. He just, he saw those things and he gave God the glory. And uh, Gil would say, though, he says, some things you struggle over and you have to struggle and struggle. And you know the truth is from God, but he makes you struggle and it doesn't come just like in a dream. He got one, one amazing thing. But he, usually... He says, I usually have to struggle. Now, God allows us. It's the, Proverbs says, it's the uh, glory of the king to hide truth, and it's the glory of man to discover it or find it out. That's the highest form of training or discipling or educating. It's not always telling your, your child what to do and how to think and so on, but letting them discover it. And uh, I saw a father in a home, and he, he had a little baby that was just learning to crawl and was crawling up the stairs. Well, immediately, the father in his uh, adult mind thought he wants to go upstairs. So he picked him up and set him upstairs, and, the, you know, the kid started crying. And he missed what was happening. He was discovering how he could climb the stairs. And the same is true in discipling. If you over-control and and do that even for a young Christian. You're, you're robbing them of something, and yet you have to know how to put it out there. And if you're hiding Easter eggs, make it easy for the young. And, uh, and yet let them discover it. And that's, that's so important. Another thing we talk about is memory. If you have an intellect, you have memory. Now, if you don't have an intellect, or you, your intellect isn't functioning, we call him in a, a person in a vegetative state. They, they cannot think as far as we know. And so uh, when you come to memory, this is something, does God have a memory? You got a scripture on it? All right, let's press this one, all right? Now, I, I looked in the Bible, I found 200 and some scriptures on God's memory. And uh, if, you, if you really begin to think about the memory of God, that's the one we often think about. He doesn't, he forgets our sins. So I, I started to imagine, okay, he's reading up there his own Bible, and he comes across Bathsheba and David. And he calls Gabriel over and says, what is this? I, I, I didn't know this happened. 
Now, is it really forget or is it to not remember it against you anymore? You see the difference? I don't think he, he really has forgot. I think he can read the Bible every day with no problem. And so he knows about the sins that were there. The Bible very clearly states those. So it's not remembering it against you. He'll never bring it up and say, aha, I caught you again. He'll say, no, don't do that, as though it hadn't happened before. You see, when you've really repented. And so, yes, you go through it again. But uh, the understanding of memory, can you imagine in our memory, if we didn't have a memory, every morning you'd have to get up and you'd have to create a language and then you'd have to teach it to people who can't remember it anyway if no one had memories. Start walking down that lane a bit about memory, and you'll start to see what a terrible thing it is. You'd be like everyone. And one of the hardest you know, diseases I can think of uh, that is mostly in the very elderly, it is Alzheimer's. You can't remember anything and how frustrating and so on. And then pretty soon you can't even remember re your relationships. And that, that's really sad because they're losing their memory. So we, we think of the importance of memory. Now God has a memory backwards. <laughs> and he's the oldest, by the way, so it's not just <laughs> for the elderly. He's the oldest in the, in the universe. So, but think backwards of what he remembers, and we just get to the end of it and say, and further, propositionally, it's forever and ever backwards. So as we consider who God is, he should be growing greater in our minds as we consider these natural attributes of God. And as you begin to see his greatness and then begin to apply it into your life, and if you truly believe him and believe who he is and what he has said to you on a personal basis and he's confirmed the word to you and you know that you know that God has spoken, what are you worried about? You, you see how ridiculous worry begins, how it becomes when you understand who he is? Just in his natural attributes. Of course, if he weren't loving, man, we would have a problem. He would know how to, boy, let's, let's make him really suffer for eternity front, you know, to the future. Oh, what a, what, what a terrible thing if Satan were infinite. And then the creative part of God. Our, David alluded to this or, or spoke, spoke about this earlier this morning. And uh, when you think of the creativity of God, in the beginning, God created. Now, God creates something where there was nothing. I heard recently a, a little story about the atheists arguing with God and saying, I can do, I can create a life. I can do what you say you did. God says, go ahead. So he goes over to pick up some dirt, and God says, get your own dirt. You see, I, I was on a plane and, uh, and I, was, I was sitting next to the window and in the middle seat was this, this uh, uh, younger man and, uh, and we started talking and I asked him about a computer because I wanted to get one for my daughter. I said, do you know anything about computers? He says, yeah, a little bit. What, what you need? And I, so we started talking. Well... It wasn't long before I found out he was one of the scientists on the Hubble <laughs> project, and he was going back to NASA to, to fix the Hubble from the ground, you know. And he pu pulled out the Newsweek magazine. He was from Caltech. And he pulled out the Newsweek, and there was a picture of his wife, who's also a scientist at Caltech, on the Newsweek cover. And so uh, he knew a little bit about computers. But, uh, <laughs> but as we talked further, he said something that, with a sad voice. He said, you know, we are doing things that have no presupposition, no foundations in our whole thinking. We are way beyond that, and it's like floating out there without any anchor. 
Now, what was that? That was a heart cry of a brilliant man who was too brilliant to say it all started with a big bang. Wait a minute. Where'd the energy come from? Where did the matter come from? Where did even the space come from? And so we begin to see if there is no God. I saw the, one of the uh, debates between uh, uh, the two professors at uh, Oxford, uh, Dawkins and the Irishman. And Dawkins is the atheist and, and uh, the Irishman, Lennox, John Lennox. I always, yeah, I should remember. And, and uh, John Lennox. And, uh, and then as I watched them, and they all started, they couldn't, they could only take their presupposition and start building on that. And the other one starts to cut it off. But, you know, from any logical stance, I, I would have to say John Lennox won, but I'm too prejudiced to think otherwise anyway. But uh, I, I just thought, oh, my. Just go back one more step. Well, in the, in the movie called Expelled, did you see that? Uh, by the way, the, almost all of the major leaders of that movie, that, that is the, the script writer, was trained here. The, the cinematographer was trained here. The producer was trained here. The director was trained here. And how they chose them, they didn't know their background. You know, Ben Stein is Jewish, and, and this was a, a Jewish-led deal from beginning to end, but they, they wanted those particular ones that we've trained here and sent into Hollywood. And uh, it was quite an amazing. But when Ben Stein, you know, the f old father who's just gentle and gray hair, white hair, really, and uh, he just asked Dawkins, he says, well, uh, well, where did we come from? You, you say, there's got to be some beginning for us. And finally, Dawkins, who was very caustic on the film, uh, he said, well, I think aliens came and actually invented us. <laughs> there you go. Now there you are. <laughs> yeah, whoa. <laughs> See, because it really is pathetic. Only a fool says in his heart there is no God. I'm quoting scripture. And, and there's a foolishness. What? <laughs> he said outer space. That's all he said. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, right. And so as, as we consider all of these, <laughs> I, yeah, I, I'll get into some things here, but uh, the creativity of God. God creates, therefore he loves it when we create. He really does. I like to uh, uh, think about all that, that God wants to create that really would serve us, but we're not ready for it, and he just can't inspire someone on that one yet. But uh, there's so many things. But do you think that that's going to stop in heaven? Now, as a kid, I, I grew up with the thinking that heaven is when you sit with your bare feet in the river of life, reaching up and grabbing fruit from the tree of life, and sort of sit there all eternity. Now, that was the, the picture was painted. Now, we know there's a tree of life and, and the river of life and all, but my goodness, if we can't do more than that, we would be bored stiff. But as C.S. Lewis points out, that heaven is so intense that even the raindrops would, would hurt you if you weren't righteous, you know? And, uh, and anyway, the great divorce. But as, as you think about what heaven is, we, we can't begin to know. We see through a glass darkly, and that's, that's the extent of it. But when we think about our earth, there's a whole lot of questions we can raise, and we should. We really should. Because when you think about who God is, uh, I, I was speaking at the University of Geneva, and uh, they had a day there in which they brought in a, a believer. And uh, we had a mixed audience, both atheists and some believers and so on. And, uh, and I've done this at many universities around the world. 
when I, I speak, I describe who God is according to the word of God and then try to give my own witness in, in the light of that. And then I open it up for question and answers. And the first question almost always, it's either the first or the second, oh, you believe in a God of love, then why do the innocent suffer? You know, with that, Rrr. and uh, I love to just say it. Oh, I'm glad you asked that question. That is such an important question because the one who was most innocent that ever lived on earth suffered the most so that the most guilty could become forgiven as if that person were innocent. Just let that hang there. Think about it. And then I said, because there was an obvious atheist at the other end of that question, and I said, but I can't understand you asking that question. You know, like, why not? I can see innocent suffering all over. And I said, because, you know, when you don't believe there is a God, then there is no ultimate or absolute truths. And, yeah, that's right. And so, therefore, if there isn't, then there's no really right or wrong. And if there's no right or wrong, then there's no guilt or innocence. So what's the question? You see, it, it's very clear, isn't it? It, it? Did you get it? If not, raise your hand. I'll say it again. Oh, don't be embarrassed. Did, I didn't get it myself. Let me say it again. <laughs> I want to hear this. <laughs> don't stop me. I want to hear it again, okay? <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> if there is no absolute God who creates truth. You, you remember Satan said in the garden to Eve, you shall be like God. In other words, you can decide your own truth. That's the beginning of the thinking of relativity of truth. Because if, if, truth, if truth doesn't come from an infinite God, there's no absolutes. I was speaking at Michigan University on the Diag. They have a place in the middle, and this was back, you know, back when they Everyone was, was going with all Hegelian philosophy and, and uh, Kierkegaard was a big star and so was Nietzsche and so were others. And so uh, I was speaking out and one young man yelled out. He said, there are no absolutes. And I said, are you absolutely sure? He said, yes. <laughs> and then everybody laughs. But... Uh, you know, you cannot help but con uh, contradict yourself in, in atheism. You cannot. And in atheism, you can never, you're trying to prove a philosophical negative. You cannot even logically prove a philosophical negative. Think about that. <laughs> you thought about it? Okay, we'll move on. But uh, then, you know, they'll ask a question, often comes up, do you believe in the virgin birth? In other words, do I believe in, in the miraculous? I, yes, of course. God is great enough that he can do those kinds of things for good purposes. It would even line up with his love. And so I not only believe that God uh, could do something like that, I believe there was not only a, a human being living on earth without a human father. I believe there was a human being who lived on earth without a human mother or a human father. Whew, we got a heretic in here, don't we? I'm, I'm thinking about Adam. Who are you thinking about? <laughs> Little trick. All right. Who was Adam's mother? Now, you can be the strongest atheist you want to be, but you got to have a first human being. Who was that first human being's mother? You ought to hear what they... No, you don't want to hear it. But anyway, you, you have to say... And mutations, yeah, they occur all the time. But they're in a downward way. You don't see them going the other way, which is the whole of history. They're at the university, by the way. They, they, they said to me... They said, uh, we are creating life in a test tube. This was back in the early 70s, and they, were, they had a huge budget for this, and they were going to create life in a test tube. And I said, I really hope that you are successful because it will prove the Bible is right. 
What do you mean? <laughs> First of all, they were cheating. They were taking a living cell, breaking it apart, and trying to put it back together. But they weren't creating life at all. They were trying to restore life, which I don't think they made it. But uh, at least I haven't heard that. But even if they did, notice the big budget getting the best minds possible in that expertise area to create from something very little, it's the greater creating the lesser. That's what the Bible says. God created us, the greater creating the lesser. Now, the atheistic way is that the lesser creates the greater. Now, prove that one in a test tube. So you, you have a test tube there that creates the scientist. You see what I'm saying? This is, this is not rocket science. This is just clear thinking about from the word of God. And so as we have this in our thinking, and why is this brought into here? This is not a philosophical course. <laughs> but yes, it's, it is because it's about God. It's a, it's a theological course, if you want to use that term. But it's, it's all about who God is. And that's what we're supposed to be about. And uh, so we have to be very clear and press the presuppositions or the foundational truths. That's where it's all at. And that's the only place where you, you'll find really anything solid to hang on to. You hang on to God. Heaven and earth will pass away, but not my word. And we know there's something there about truth. Now, what I've said about God in the infinite and for time rut wise you can say that about man in the finite, most, you know, just move down to the finite. We have an intellect. We have a will. We have emotions. Now, let me ask this. Does God have a will? You ever heard of the will of God? Okay. We don't have to prove that, take time at this time, but I would uh, uh, normally in a class, you know, I'll take several days for this and talk about the will of God. But the will of God is really the potential of God his power, his potency. The power of God is infinite. His intellect is the knowledge of God. That's infinite. The will of God is the power of God, but it's his potential. But he doesn't go around using all of his power every day. <laughs> you know, it, it, the atheist that goes out and says, if you're real, God, strike me dead. That's kind of like a, an ant, you know, and the big steam rollers rolling out the asphalt and uh, an ant saying, I dare you, I dare you, squish. And uh, that would be nothing for God. But all you prove is the, the self-control of God and the love of God. That's all you're proving. And so in, in that process of the will of God, often we play against the will of God that is infinite, or his power, his potential, and uh, his potency. All of that is, is the same, same area. But we also play that against the omniscience of God. So when you play at omniscience and omnipotence, and you, you go back and forth, even in the history of theology, as you do, you, you know, you get the one side and then the other, and, and you, you retreat to the extremes, and the extremes are always wrong anyway. But there is something about finiteness that you cannot really discern uh, between those two at, at times. And uh, even what Augustine said, he had no counterpart in his day to question at, at his, his ability to write and, and uh, speak out. He had no counterpart, and therefore you couldn't really get the, the blend of the truth that we must have. Because many people will go clear across to the omniscience of God, and then they live like God is an eternal, infinite computer that has no choice and no power, therefore, is really needed, and therefore, just, just do what he said. And, you know, it's like uh, I heard the story of, a, uh, of a, uh, a Calvinist and an Arminius and a Wywammer that all went to hell. And uh, the extreme Calvinist said, well, I know you're righteous. You just predestined me here, and I bow to that. I'll live here. And the, the uh, Armenian said, I know I did wrong, and that's why I'm here. 
and I'll, I'll bow to that. And the YWAMer is over in the corner praying, oh, God, teach me what you want me to learn so I can get out of here. <laughs> so whatever. Anyway, I, I don't think the story is true. <laughs> but, uh, but at least the concept is there. There's a blending that we cannot really know or define because we are finite and we're talking about the infinite. But don't go so far on either side that you become a fatalist, whether it's a theistic fatalist or a uh, non-theistic, atheistic fatalist. Don't go there. An atheistic fatalist is one who believes that everything is chemically determined and uh, it's just a matter of time plus space plus chance plus energy uh, equals everything that is. And that's a, that's a horrible fatalism. There's no meaning to life. Therefore, there's no hope, there's no purpose, and it goes on and on. And ultimately, there's no love. But as we consider uh, the, uh, the role that man is playing in this, the, ro the role includes man's feelings. Now, this is often, uh, there's, a, there's the emotions of God. Have you ever considered the emotions of God? Now, I, I skipped over omnipresence, but... You understand, we try to get there through electronics, IT, Chung Ho's helping me to get. I spoke in April from here to 147 bases at the same time of YWAM, just in the time zone of uh, North and South America. And, uh, and it was really neat. And I could see their face and so on. They weren't all able to get on our... Uh, video conferencing, some of them were streaming, streaming video, but just to think what you can do now. But we can never really be omnipresent, right? But uh, <laughs> it sure be nice sometimes when you jet lag. But uh, think of the area of emotions. Now, this is the area of the personality of God. Does God have emotions? According to the Bible, not, not according to what you, you think. <laughs> According to the Bible, does God have emotions? He will rejoice over, joy over you with singing. Yes, that's Zephaniah 3.17. But uh, there's a joy. You can live to make God happy. That's what Zephaniah is saying there. And uh, does he have anger? No. Oh, yes. And does he have... Uh, does he have brokenheartedness. There's also the understanding of truth. I, I've really skipped over a lot of application for man. Man made in the image of God. Male and female made he them in the image of God. That's, that's an amazing, amazing truth. And into that truth, we also have the, uh, the humbling of God. That God is a humble God that he humbled himself and took on the form of a man and entered into the world, not as a king or a potentate or whatever, but he came into the world. The incarnation is one of the most amazing truths of all, all of the things we can think about, who God is, who God is. I didn't tell you all the things about creation for God, but I, I would say this, that God is so great, he created for Adam a wife without a mother-in-law. When you consider the greatness of God, this, this is absolutely amazing. Now, I, I don't know why you're laughing. I, I have a wonderful mother-in-law. <laughs> you be sure to tell her that. But uh, when, when you see creative and then you come into man's creation, where I should ask you this question. When God created Adam, how old do you think he looked, Adam looked, five minutes later? Was he a baby kicking in the dirt, crying for sustenance, or was he a grown man in the prime of life? Which? Are you sure? Was he a baby? Don't you think so? All right, God can create someone full grown in the prime of life. And prime of life, that's, uh, that's age 74. That's... <laughs> Now, how do you know? Have you been there yet? <laughs> See, you can't know those things. You're just, yeah. Anyway, you're just projecting. Anyway, 
as, as you understand the creativity of God, he can create something out of nothing or he can use something and create. But he wants us to be creative. So therefore, look at truth. Now, because of the Bible, we have the scientific method. The first, out of the first six uh, founders of, of, of uh, science, five of them were Bible-believing Christians. Now, when you think about this, just think about what truth is according to the Bible versus what truth is te being taught in most major universities today. Most major universities are now teaching with volume always going up that truth is only relative. There are no absolutes. There's nothing stable. You can throw a ball up a thousand times, and the thousand and first time, it may not come back. There is nothing that is stable. So truth is relative. And therefore, truth can't be known because you have your truth, I have mine. And all truth, what are they saying? They're saying the same thing that Satan said, you shall be as gods. You make your own truth. Now, Algis Huxley says, the reason we don't want God is we want freedom to be immoral and have all the sex we want anytime and so on. He writes this. It's so that you won't feel guilty because there's a God who will hold you accountable. So when you consider this and see who God is, he's only loving. And when you understand that truth is not relative there is, as, as Dr. Schaefer called it, true truth. In other words, there is an absolute truth. And you can know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So is that scriptural? Does truth change? Heaven and earth will pass away, not my word. So truth is a constant, and truth can be known. It's knowable. So this is the basis for scientific uh, method because you look at something and then you look at it different ways and create an hypothesis and then you go out and, and research all available data on it and then you do an experiment and then you reach a conclusion, then you communicate your findings. So when truth changes by the time you communicate your finding, the thing won't work again. Think of what that does to our, our universities. I was in Asia, and I heard on CNN, I didn't hear the, the name of the university that I'd tuned in late, and they were saying that in that university that is known for its chemistry, that they have no, uh, no one but ethnic Asians in the chemistry department today. Now, this is not anything to say against ethnic Asians. It's saying that they are the ones that haven't been, been bombarded as much regarding relativity of truth. I, was, uh, uh, I got to know a, a, a journalist at the, the change of the century and this change of the millennium down in New Zealand. And uh, the Christians had gathered by the thousands from around the world at uh, Gisborne, which is the first city that sees the sun in all the world, the first city. And so there's an island, Pitt Island, that sees it first. But uh, uh, all the Christians were gathered together to celebrate the coming of the new millennium. And uh, the uh, journalist representing China, he was from the news agency in China. We got acquainted and talked and... and uh, quite friendly, actually. And, uh, and I said, you know, I expect China be to become uh, the leading power in all the world in this century, this new century, uh, as long as two things occur. One is, is that uh, as long as China continues to turn toward God and the Bible at their present rate, and they continue until they're about 25% or more, that's the tipping point, when it'll start affecting all of society and uh, they'll start to change their worldview to the God of the Bible. 
God is infinite and personal, God, you know, and all of these things I'm telling you is really the foundations for our worldview as a biblical Christian worldview. And Schaefer would always correct us if we said a Christian biblical world. No, no, it's a biblical Christian worldview. I never quite understood, but I went along with it because he's Schaefer. And uh, so I, I said the other thing that has to occur is the West needs to continue to turn away from God and the God of the Bible and the Bible at their present rate. And somewhere during this century, they will pass each other, one going down, one going up. Now, I would say that doesn't have to happen if we turn around in the West. It will happen. And just think of it just in the area of truth. It, as, as you don't believe in truth more and more, then you're going to start saying, well, all truth is relative. Therefore, even your God is relative and, and so on. And that's where it's going. And yet they have a hunger for the spiritual. So where do you think they're going to tie in? To Madame Blavatsky, the, the uh, founder of the New Age movement, for one, or whatever it, they're going to use. By the way, she's the one that went to the Tibetan monk and was given there by one of their top men the uh, uh, swastika. And she was told to go back to this uh, place in Northern Europe and tell them they were the this very special people. I, I have a book in German, but it's never come out in English, but it's, it's for the Germans, showing the history of what happened spiritually to allow such a great nation who gave us the Bible, who gave us the first major revival out of the, the, uh, the Protestant movement, the Moravians, who gave us the prayer movement where they started the 24-7 prayer movement for 100 years. They gave us... Uh, the the uh, the the whole Reformation, as you begin to see the greatness of what they had, and then how far down they fell, and how uh, Adolf Hitler was a young man with his friend watching as uh, Wagner's uh, drama was being done with their mu uh, musical drama, and. Uh, his friend said, something came over Adolf. I'd never seen it before, and he never became the same after that. Wagner was the music that, of course, he always used uh, after that. And Va uh, Wagner was a close friend of Nietzsche, who was the son of a Lutheran pastor who said God is dead, and they became fast friends, so on. So you start seeing these linkages, and you begin to see now here's Blavatsky, who's Russian, actually living in, in England, and she brings in this truth about the Ar 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 Armenian race that is so great and it's above all others, and here's your sign. And they turned it a little bit, but it's the swastika that was given. It's, it's an amazing thing to study researching in that area. But uh, when, you, when you see the connectedness of what people believe, and then you watch them as they are, are a spirit and they can't satisfy that area, they will find always a counterfeit unless someone comes in the spirit of Jesus himself with the spirit of truth. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by Jesus. And as you bring that, it's, it's really amazing. There was a New Age group that was meeting up in Norway, and a young man that used to be in YWAM, he's, he's uh, uh, not so young anymore, but he's in his 40s, but he called the YWAM leader, and he says, I want you to protect me. I think God is telling me I was invited to a New Age group, uh, a small group of 20 or so, and, uh, and they're going to uh, talk about power. And it was spiritual power. And so he says, okay, we'll pray together. And they did ahead of time. And he went in there. And they went around the room talking about where they found the greatest power. And uh, they got to him as a Christian. He said, I found it in a person. And he began to tell them about Jesus and the things Jesus had done that he had seen. And he said, the whole place just turned and said, we, we've heard about churches. We've heard about Christianity, but we don't know what you're talking about. Could you tell us about Jesus as you know him? That's the hunger that is there. And that'll bring us back to the fact, if he's the truth, he is, of course, the unchangeable one. And uh, as we understand that truth is unchangeable, and it can be known. You can know him, and you'll know the truth. 
And, but that opens up all the rest. And then out of that comes our responsibilities. Uh, too much is given, much is required, and that's the end. But uh, we just ran out of time here. But, uh, yeah, you got a whole Bible full of <laughs> challenging you to be responsible. It's a joy to have each one of you here. And uh, through, walk through the Bible, people are just some of my heroes. They can take you through the Bible and, and teach you how to get the overall look of the Bible. And I don't think that's really been said yet here, but uh, uh, we just uh, just thank God for the walk through the Bible because people start saying, oh, I, the Bible isn't a stranger to me. I can really learn it. And, and as a result, they're training so many to learn to love the Word of God. And I want to honor all of you that are here and you've come so far. I hope that this will be for everyone uh, these, these days as we're giving you some parameters at the beginning here and understanding, trying to put framework to it. But uh, as, as we begin to be inspired by God's truth and truth about God, you will begin to understand that that's... That's, that's just the beginning. It's knowing him. That's what it's all about. It's the relationship with him. And you may not be able to say in your language that who God is and how he is, all of that. But you can say what he's been to you. You are a witness. And as you're a witness unto him, it's, it's wonderful as you get to know him. He's so wonderful. And we're going to have all of it all of eternity to learn more and more about the infinite one who is Paul so personal. God bless you. Thank you, Lord, as you share with us who you are, revealing to us even nature, Paul says in Romans 1, that even nature describes who you are. And it's not a, a chemical reaction or a chemical uh, accident that we have been created. It's done out of love a God who is all love and you so love the world that you gave your only begotten son. What a truth. And yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Amen. I think it's just wonderful how even how Lauren led us because he spent 95% of the time on the number one about one, he made mention to that man as finite and personal, spent about 4% on the truth is constant and knowable, and then just reminded us that three and a half, I was, had my math off. But then just at the end, that, that man is responsible. Our choices have consequences. And though those four are a foundation, that is what is distinctly biblical Christian. Okay, that, that is the presupposition, the foundations of everything that we do as leaders and what we must do as we go into ministry. The thing that grips you in this is the knowledge of God. And that's why it's just, it's the heart desire, the, the passionate love relationship with we, that we have with him that, that leads us to spend 95% of the time talking about that one point. Because if he were not who he is, the other three points would be insignificant anyway. Isn't that right? So let's just, let's allow during these three weeks our love for God, our love for our, our reflection upon who he is, uh, exercising our full heart, mind, and spirit, all of our capacities. May we just be drawn to him. And if, you know, we go through different seasons of life, and just in your prayers, just pray for yourself, pray for one another, just for increased hunger and thirst and longing and love and passion after God. Because this is what is going to really be the thing that, transforms us as leaders and allows us to be the transformational leaders that God is looking to have. Thank you, Lauren, for, for uh, evidencing this passion of God in just the way you uh, occupy the time here this afternoon.